Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, host and executive producer for Rip Rap, the academic book television program. Our guest today is Margaret Norton, who contributed to a major book project in Native American studies, published by the University of Manitoba Press in Winnipeg, Canada, and Michigan State University Press in East Lansing. Welcome to Rip Rap. Thank you. Miigwech. <laughs> so th this is a lot of fun. I thought this was a really good book, but because I'm language challenged, I need to have you read the title <laughs> and the uh, editors of this uh, anthology. Well, the title, Centering Anishinaabek Studies, is using our language to indicate that the Anishinaabek are a group of people, not that Anishinaabe is an adjective, as it is often used. So I kind of like that they use the word that way. Um, then the names of the folks who edited it, Jill Dorfler teaches at Duluth, Nigan Waywoodham Sinclair is over at Manitoba, and Heidi Kiwait Nibanasik Stark. I often think of her as Kiwait Nibanasik, I guess. And the title of the book is? Centering Anishinaabek Studies, Understanding the World Through Stories. So the way I interpreted this, the way they described it, is that it's an offering or a gift that hopes to engage, affirm, and inspire relationships with all who read it and is a gesture toward future offerings. And I thought that was really interesting. This is easily one of the best books I've seen, I think, in Native Studies. Not that I'm an expert on it, but, you know, I've been <laughs> following it since I interviewed Phil Deloria in his book. And mm -hmm. it, these books are starting to get some real heft to them now. Um, but apparently it emerged at the 2008 American Indian and Indi Indigenous Studies Conference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that it's partly following on a number of different gatherings where people have been working to balance both national interests, so wanting to define their identity as a nation or as a geographical group, as a language group, a cultural group, but then also to be in conversation with other groups. So you'll see a lot of books, a lot of conversations about that kind of tension between focusing on one nation and then focusing on Native studies as a whole. And how did you get involved with this? Mostly through the literature and, and language. So I typically attend the gatherings annually where Native scholars get together and study literature, study language. Locally, we have a lot of things that are, they're all Anishinaabe. So we have conferences that are just all our language, all our stories. and. Sometimes when we get together in a more national setting, we are really inspired by how many different groups now have people writing both in their language and in English about their own culture in a way that can be comparative and be useful, not just insular and focused only on the culture, but really in a way to compare across nations. So where the Anishinaabe people located? I, not everyone knows this. Yeah, I usually tell people, you think of the Great Lakes, and then you just draw a big, roughly 600, maybe 800, depending on which period of history you're in, 800-mile um, circle around the Great Lakes. And that's very vague, and it's very general. And at any given point in history, you could trace exact nations or exact patterns of movement. Um, over time, even just the idea of what's a nation, what's a reservation, what's in Canada called a, a First Nation Reserve, that's changed and shifted, but it's still, you will have on the far western edge of the Great Lakes, on the southern edge around, on the east and in the north, you'll have the same language group, same stories, and it's fun to compare how they can be different, but still similar. Aren't they known as the water people? They are, yeah, as definitely the lakes people, lakes and rivers and, and woodland. I mean, you will often hear the woodland people repeatedly, yeah. So how did you get involved with the book? A lot of the people in here are scholars I would consider contemporary to me. Um, we have a number of scholars. I think of Jerry Visner, for example, as someone who, when I was growing up, he made it more common to say Anishinaabe instead of saying like Minnesota Chippewa. That's what we would use that term all the time. And the reservation names still are legally Minnesota Chippewa bands. Um, but 
He got people thinking about Anishinaabek. There was a long tradition, of course, then that gradually, I think, became uncovered. So this group of people is really a number of authors who we were lucky enough to grow up sort of during and then study after AIM, which you can argue all kinds of politics about the merits and, and trials and challenges of the AIM movement, but certainly our civil rights struggles in the 70s made it possible for us to study our language, to write about our language. The Native Languages Act in the, the mid-90s made it possible for this to even happen. I grew up in Minneapolis, and so we saw all this happen, and we, I think a lot of us feel like we got a chance to do something our parents and definitely our grandparents couldn't do. And AIM is, because not everyone knows right. that. Yes, I happen exactly. to, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we often try to explain uh, for anyone who was, I would say, in their teens and on up, who grew, was around in the 70s, in America, of course, there were a lot of civil rights movements, and many times they overlapped and worked together. The American Indian Movement, also known as AIM, began out on the western side of the country uh, with Alcatraz, but then in the center part of the country in Minneapolis where some of the original leaders were from and you saw pieces being pulled back together. So relocation, um, the boarding schools, there had been national movements that separated people both from their original land, from their language, from each other and with AIM you saw them kind of pulling back together and they cleared a lot of space. They, they made a lot of noise. They did a lot of things that I think got some attention and some of it was the kind of attention that made things like Native Studies possible, I think. We had done a program with Moose Pamp. Oh, yeah. Talking about the pageants, yeah. not for Rip Rap, but for an independent mm -hmm. study uh, thing and it was qu pretty interesting. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> the Pamps, pretty, that's, a, yeah. <laughs> that's a, a family with some history there, yeah. Because we went to uh, up north in the UP. Yeah. And he was in a, I've never seen so many state police cars at one place. <laughs> really, there was like 20. Wow, wow. In the UP, you're lucky if you yeah, see Yeah, really, anything. that's like. <laughs> and you know, and that's when they're doing the thing of sitting down during the national anthem. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so when that happened, they started arresting people and huh. you know, stuff and hauling them off. Yeah. It's a pretty impressive power thing. Mm -hmm. But the, the issue about language is really an important uh, thing and that's what you talk about in this book but uh, there's one article I read that talked about this thing of taking away language or you know is mm -hmm. cultural genocide but on the positive thing of teaching it and, and getting right. it. I, th I think it's I think it's central to people knowing who they are and feeling that they can connect with each other and with history and even create a space for themselves. Um, <coughs> um, I guess I think that the language is a way to create identity, to continue narrative that can do things other languages can't do. It doesn't mean one language is better than another. It doesn't mean people who write native novels in English aren't native. It just means when you do it in Anishinaabemwin or Paiute or Diné or Nimipu or whatever language might be your tradition that you're able to do things. You're literally able to make sounds and juxtapositions and images that you just couldn't do in English. So it's just a matter of whether you're using watercolor or oil painting or it's just a different medium. But, but you have to practice with it. It has to be there. You can't take it for granted. You have to spend time learning in it, um, being in that language, you become proficient and be able to do things that our elders could have done. Um, I think that's something over time people would use bits and pieces symbolically and gradually we've gotten to where we use more and more of it. It can be a very difficult language to learn for someone who mm -hmm. speaks English as a native language. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who teaches writing, that one of the biggest gaps is between English and certain other language families like Asian. But I think the Native American languages are like that because the concepts are so much different. Yeah, it it can be, and I've always have kind of two minds on that. So 
it is extremely complex and I would never want to underestimate the richness and complexity of it. But then, you know, so is physics, so are fractals, so are many of the other things that we study and we have disciplines around, we have um, ways of creating new ways of understanding, of mapping the patterns within these things. So I tend to think that it is a little bit like physics. If you love it and you stay at it, then it will feel feel easy eventually. So you often tell those first year students that yes, this seems really hard now, but if it's what you want to do, it can be very rich and very, very rewarding. It's not something that has to remain a puzzle that's unknowable and so complicated that you just have to give up, which I think in some ways our language has got that kind of reputation. People felt if I don't just know it automatically, this should be my heritage, it should be easy, I should just know it. And they didn't really understand the work of learning it and really the pleasure of having done that work. Like anything else you want to do well, if you practice until it's instinctive, that's when you can get really creative with it. I read a book by a guy who speaks 25 languages. Wow. <laughs> and the, when he started out, he was in Latin class and the first mm -hmm. day they spoke Latin. The second mm -hmm. class is typical of American language instruction. They were doing grammar, mm -hmm. and it turned into a rather horrible experience. So he got his father to take him down to the docks in Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. and they connected with a Chinese sailor to act as a mentor. And so the guy, as a result, learned Chinese before he learned Latin, which was <laughs> basic to English. But the, what he remarked is the way you start out with a language to learn it is to speak it. Mm -hmm and get mm -hmm. someone as a mentor to show you how to say it and what basic functions like, you know, what food is and mm -hmm. where to go to the bathroom and, you know, um, all those basic functions and then start looking at the technical side of the grammar, you know, mm -hmm. dissecting it. And, and that's how he had learned 25 languages and I think it's a really valuable lesson. Mm -hmm. I think a major problem for a lot of people in this country is that they know maybe one language. And so they had, once you get past that barrier of the first language and you get into the second and third and fourth, then it becomes easier because you realize, well, this is how this language is different. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think I've come to realize that we're at a point historically where people can approach the language a couple of different ways. So if, if a family or community or group of people wants to have it be their vernacular language, they can construct an environment where it can be that. Um, you see different tribes doing this more and more. They have immersion classes, they have summer camps, they have parts of their heritage, say the Pokagon Band recently was reviving sugar bush tradition on their land and they did a lot of that in the language. They had elders who knew the language visit and so it became connected to a practice and that's one way but I think we also have people who are studying it to look back at history so sometimes they want that kind of grammar the very efficient approach where they want to say show me how it works in terms of the mechanics and equations and then that's their entree point some people do um, the apprentice ship model that Leanne Hinton will often write about and they work really closely with a mentor and then you can watch the language move from one generation to the next one individual at a time so I guess I've I've probably learned over the years that right now all those points are valid any way that you want to come into it is good so frankly I think it would be great if we had every high schooler learn a little bit. It's Michigan. Any of those states, Michigan, Wisconsin, we have a number of them where the very name of the state is an Anishinaabe word. So to learn a little can be a great start. And then if they get that chance to, like you say, hang out at the dock and make it more real, it's worth it. I think too the other thing that um, is really important is letting the language teach you. So it's very much a kind of subject verb, maybe dominant culture now, way to view things. You can buy it, you can possess it, you can learn it. And instead, if you let the language kind of teach you or sort of own you, you start thinking differently. And when I see students do that, 
then they just learn so much faster. So when you start actually making the connections about how a verb like Deb Wemigut, which just means something is inherently true, how that moves to Deb way, I'm correct, or good Deb way, you're right, to Deb way, oh, I believe somebody, then you start seeing a different way to look at things and you learn exponentially faster if you just be open to different patterns and reorienting the world to verbs and how verbs construct relationships. But isn't so. that verb thing a particular characteristic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And when people get that, then it's like a little key or, or something where all of a sudden, you know, the sun sort of rises and centers on things a little bit different, which, you know, to get back to the title, Centering Anishinaabeg Studies, where, you know, maybe that's what this book is trying to do, to take those ways of knowing that are Anishinaabeg and center those so that other things are just plain viewed in a slightly different light from a different angle laid up against each other in a different way and whether that's your nation and it resonates for you because you want to learn more about that specific topic or whether it just plain allows you to see what you're doing a different way. I have a good friend that does a marine hydrology, he's an engineer and probably selling him short on the things that he does, but anyway, um, Guy Meadows, uh, who studies what's underneath Lake Huron, and we've done a lot of work with him where we will talk about water and land and caves and movement and sturgeons and the ways you understand the lakes from an Anishinaabe perspective, and you know, he's doing science and we're doing language, but they can collide and inform each other in really useful ways. One of the issues, of course, with language and Native American is the the repressive things that had gone on mm -hmm. with the government before where they tried to do what I would call ethnic cleansing mm -hmm. by the native schools and all mm -hmm. those kind of things. And I think that's presented a barrier now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's <coughs> two things on that. I think one is that it's particularly divisive and difficult that the missionaries, truth be told, were a big part of it. So the very Jesuits who on one hand were attempting to share an understanding of something profound and meaningful and based on love and, and such a part of well-being that when that had an edge of, like you say, language genocide or linguicide or whatever people want to call it, it was particularly bad, you know. So if you're gonna go to battle, to go to battle on a battlefield, knowing you're going to battle, that's one thing. But to go and worship and find out that instead you're at battle, that's I think particularly hard. Um, I think that the legacy that it also leaves us in terms of education is particularly difficult. So our very best speakers are often the least prepared to do things like maneuver into book contracts and figure out how to earn equality in the in the academy. So it's always balancing people who had a difficult, terrible experience within education, pulling them into that arena again to hopefully rebuild it a different way is, is a, a challenge as well, which we hope enough of our language stays with us that the next generation will not have the same problems you know, we hopefully see it get better each each generation. Well, after you read this book, I was trying to imagine what it would be like to have an institution of higher education that was native. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, and you have yeah. tribal colleges where you see things <clears throat> different. They don't grant degrees or earn, you know, research funding at the same rate as the other institutions around them always. but. Some of them have gained real traction and have earned accreditation. Um, and then you also just see different colleges now having pretty vocal scholars. So you have scholars in administration, you have scholars who are chairing departments, who are making admissions decisions, who are engaged in a way that can create sustained change as long as they don't give up who they are, you know, I think that's the trick. I always go to work and I think, okay, there's 
two ways to view things and you want to find that middle ground or pull it toward the Anishinaabe if you can, but you have to understand where you can't do that too. It's not always possible. I was thinking there wouldn't be any hierarchies. Yeah, maybe not, but you know. certainly not in the way that we think of them now. But I think there would be some you always want. Like if you move in a pack, you want a bear claw. I can think of the last time that I was out at the Native uh, Literature Symposium in Shakopee, Minnesota, and it was held at, of course, the Mittawankton, uh Reservation out there at their casino, and, and uh, Nigon was there, and there were a bunch of us in a group, and we were talking about which of us were Bear Clan, and which of us were Martin Clan, and which were different clans, because it is good to have people have roles. I mean, nobody wants to have to pretend they're good at everything, so to have a way of designating who's good at what, who can do different things at different times and to have people willing to lead and people willing to follow is is important but I think you're right to not have hierarchy that piles up or oppresses Freshmen, anyone sophomore group. junior mm -hmm. seniors yeah, automatically yeah. have to identify with that yeah, I, yeah it was it was kind of uh, interesting to, to just rethink the whole mm -hmm. business and obviously yeah. it would be something to do with competencies Right. In other words, the people who had more competence would be higher ranked. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure that tests would be a part of it, but mentoring and right. certifying would yeah. be. Yeah, the mentoring thing would be huge because you always have elders that are experts. You always have artisans who are known for what they do well, and they are always passing that along. So people understanding who are the experts, who are the elders, and then who are the learners and who are the next generation being held accountable for, for taking on the, the challenge of preserving or teaching whatever it might be. So you have hierarchy, certainly the elders are on top, but not hopefully if they're good elders, I mean there's good elders and elders who take advantage of being an elder, um, but if they're really good elders they're doing that in a way that's compassionate and they're doing it in a way that doesn't feel oppressive or belittling to the people who are respectful. I mean, learning, you know, it's right? Yeah, more of what they call the servant leadership. Mm -hmm. that, Absolutely, yeah. That you're yeah. lower than the other people. You just have the advantage right. of experience and, and knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I just thought that'd be really interesting because a mm -hmm. lot of my students are just struggling to figure oh, out yeah. what they're doing and yeah. why they're doing it, and yeah. they're not particularly identifying with it. Right. You know, yeah. they're just going through the motions, and they're thinking, "Boy, this is." I think that's true. Yeah, we were talking about that recently at the Ann Arbor Pawa, how many people there were understanding how the traditional dances balanced the competition and how the competition, broken out as it was by age, um, allowed for that kind of thing to happen. So you didn't have a sort of winner-takes-all vicious vote them off the island kind of scenario. You really had an understanding that there would be many people who won and then some people who danced and did the very same thing but for different reasons who weren't competing who weren't wearing numbers and it was an interesting blend and it was nice to see everybody just sort of get together and be part of the circle moving forward even though they might have all had different agendas and reasons for being there but it's really the community that counts not mm -hmm. the individual glory right, right. and the yeah. medals yeah yeah exactly <laughs> I thought what might be interesting is to have you read. Um, I will try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, as I explained to you, um, it's an interesting thing. And I would say uh, I do these type of things. And I always think, what will I think 10 years from now when I look back on this? And certainly there was a time when I finished my PhD and no one on my committee actually spoke the language and even Jim Northrup who I wrote about as part of my doctoral thesis in 2001 when I defended it was not conversant in the language and both of us have come a long way in our language since that time and I think it is always important to keep pushing ourselves so for me now if I've been teaching uh, all day or hanging out with people speaking. The best would be if I had just been up at, you know, Fond du Lac for a week or so and then you said, oh now read and I'd been talking to people in the language. It would be 
much nicer. But still, it, it does give you a sustained sense of what it sounds like. So, so I can try those. Um, I said the ones that are probably easier for me to read are the ones that I wrote because people make different word choices and some of the things that I quoted in here, I quoted um, particularly because they represent word choices and sound structures that are different than I might use. So they're fun to read, but it's more like you'd have to practice longer to do it well. Um, so I can, how many do you want me to read? A couple and then you'll pick. <laughs> No, just you could read one of yours. Okay, so I, it's just I want to get yeah get people get the right to, to hear, hear it. it. So this one, which is um, one that I, it's called Bizindan Mut, which is the sound of the wind, which I often think of um, as what I would call home in a lot of ways. So I'll just read that one. I'll read it all the way through in Nishnabemwin, and then I can read it in English after that if you want. Noden, denonden, nanagodnong. Pi zisigwa, nagamwat, jingwok. Pi squandamok, mawiwat. Pi babishkawat, wasetchiganok. Midash gwekanamat, bunanamat, ningach pitanamat. Nongwa jisakane ni dash kiton wewene jisakane. Midash. Majigaskan awazat, nodnong. Gekajigaba, Windamayangadwa, Bimadzik, Ejuindaying, Miko Jinangidwa, Debwemagat, Nikanonic. Meet you. That's it. That's the end of that one. Um, to hear it in English, which is fairly literal. I don't often worry if it sounds good in English anymore. When I was working on an MFA in writing with uh, people like Pat Hampel and Robert Bly and Michael Dennis Brown. I worried about what it sounded like in English. I don't worry now. <laughs> so this one literally says, I hear the wind sometimes. When the pines sing sisigwa, when the doors cry, when the windows shake, then the wind shifts, lets up, and slows down to a new speed. Now the tent shaker can carefully build his tent, and the wordless whispers begin in the wind. The old ones tell us to live as we are named, and we feel their wisdom in our bones. Which is a good one to But the word use. for wind is right, exactly. meaningful in itself. Exactly, it? yeah. Um for me, I for a long time have been called Gewadenodin in Nishnabemwin and had recently, as you can see from the cover, some of my other colleagues had changed their last names to kind of reclaim a Nishnabemwin. And so I recently did the same thing before doing more writing and had talked it over with my dad who thought it was just a fun idea and a way to express something different about the place. Well, thank you for being on Rip Rev. Well, thank you as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs>